So uh, Shelley asked me to talk about uh, the importance of research in rare diseases. And I want to give you a little bit of background about me so you understand about me. I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, Shelley uh, has educated me a little bit about Barth syndrome. I would say, uh, quite frankly, in my 40 years of experience uh, uh, being at the Children's Hospital Medical Center, I've never seen a case of Barth syndrome. Uh, uh, not to say that there wouldn't be any cases here, because I think there clearly are. It just hasn't come to my attention. So in my role, what I do here at the Children's Hospital is uh, for a long period of time, from about 1986 till 2009, I was the program director for the General Clinical Research Center, which was funded by NIH through a center called the National Center for Research Resources. And uh, more recently, since 2009, I've been uh, the director for our uh, version of the Clinical Translational Science Award, which is funded by NIH through initially through NCRR and then more recently through what's called NCAS, which is the National Center for Advancing Translational Science. And as such, um, I've been involved over the last 40 years in a few projects related to rare diseases that are unrelated to Barth syndrome, but actually have clear relevance to what you folks are interested in, in terms of the long-term advancement of understanding and treatment of Barth syndrome. Uh, so let me start from the very beginning. When I came to Cincinnati uh, in 1975, I thought I was going to be a clinical gastroenterologist. I came from Indiana University after I'd done my residency training in pediatrics, and I said, well, I'll go out and practice pediatric GI, and I'll be happy, and that'll be really great. Well, it didn't exactly turn out that way. Uh, I got very interested in research at our institution, and this was a site where there was... Uh, it was kind of like a kid in a candy shop that you come and you identify the opportunities that are available here that were not available at Indiana. And uh, I got very interested in what's called bile acid metabolism. Bile acid metabolism is the bile acids are the natural products of the body that help with absorption of fat and fat soluble vitamins, and they're a major stimulus for bile flow in the liver. And long about uh, 1987, uh, I had a collaborator I worked with from before that we started uh, trying to look at patients with uh, what's called newborn jaundice, not the kind of physiologic jaundice that all kids get, but the kind of jaundice that kids get associated with liver disease. And we tried to then define whether there are any patients that we would see that had errors in the bile acid synthetic pathway. And lo and behold, uh, in 1987, we saw our first pair of twins with these abnormalities. And then subsequently, we have actually identified uh, four new uh, diseases within uh, the bile salt synthetic pathway for which we have specific therapy for. And uh, through a process that uh, you can appreciate as having uh, parents of ch kids with a rare disease, uh, we... Uh, identified over the course of the last um, almost 30 years, 25 plus years, 270 patients with these abnormalities of whom we've treated many of them. And through the d information we accrued during the course of treatment, uh, we uh, ultimately got EMA approval and then FDA approval on March 17, 2015 for treatment of these conditions. The, the the treatment for these conditions turned out to be based upon some scientific work that had been done probably 50 plus years ago when it was recognized that if you give an exogenous bile acid, these natural detergents, which you can get from a variety of sources, um, uh, including standard uh, chemical companies, uh, not that's not what we administer to kids, but certainly you could use it that way. It turns out that when you give exogenous bile acids, you suppress the synthesis of bile acids and you block the production of the metabolites that are injurious to the patients and you cure the disease. So we've actually found a cure for these diseases over the course of this time. So I'm just giving you my perspective about where I'm coming from so you understand about rare diseases uh, and where I've actually been. So the first of these is, the first slide I show you is this little girl 
who is actually querying why study children with rare diseases. And, you know, obviously you guys know as parents and potentially as people that are affected with a rare disease, there is a potential direct uh, benefit to affected patients. Um, and uh, therapies may be created uh, that are based upon the pathophysiology that improve the outcomes of affected patients. And as you probably are aware, you know, there are three phases, actually four phases of drug trials. Phase one trials are typically the ones in which all you're doing is looking to see if the drug may be safe, not necessarily looking for an effect, but sometimes, quite remarkably, there's efficacy identified even in the phase one trials, and kids and adults in phase one trials can benefit. Certainly, as you move through the structure from phase one to phase two to phase three to phase four, phase two trials tend to be relatively small, but they're looking for efficacy to find out if the drug is effective. And then phase three trials become larger trials in larger populations of patients, uh, leading to registration by the FDA and ultimately approval of a drug for treatment. And then finally, phase four trials are designed to be uh, evaluate the effects of drugs when they're given to larger populations of patients that are not so restricted as part of the phase two or, or phase three trials. So you have to realize that for studies of rare disease, the initial therapies may not directly impact the care of children in the study, but may impact the care of a class, this class of patients in the future, meaning that even if we do studies now in children and young adults that have Barr syndrome, they may in fact not directly benefit. However, they're laying the ground for kids with the disease or young adults with the disease in the future to benefit from the therapy that is actually tested. And so by the way, if I get uh, too much in the weeds, by all means, ask me questions. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to ask questions, by all means, just butt in and ask, all right? You're still there? We have everybody muted, so you don't have a lot. So we don't have a lot of um, a lot of delay. So if you hear, you feel like you're hearing the sounds of crickets in the background, it's because we're all muted, so we can not have any distortion. Um, I have not I have not heard a single cricket, but you're welcome to butt in anytime you like and ask questions. But or we can wait until the very end, whichever you like. It just might take us a little bit of time to get to the point where we unmute ourselves and then mute ourselves back, but we're, we're definitely, in fact, this is what we have so far. We have some, a mom who said you have to come to the birth side, so I think you're doing pretty good. I think that's what Shelly said to me the other day. <laughs> that's that's going to be our chant. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, uh, as we were commenting, I know your next meeting is in Clearwater, and I've been there a few times for soccer tournaments my, when my kids were little. So the other piece that I think that people don't really appreciate about studying rare diseases is that sometimes studying rare diseases like Barr syndrome may lead to discoveries related to more common diseases. A classic example of this is we know that with hypercholesterolemia type 2, which can be a very severe disease with early atherosclerosis and heart attacks in childhood or strokes early in life. That led the discovery of uh, uh, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, which now obviously most adults, believe it or not, probably are on statin. Certainly I am because my internist convinced me after arguing him for a long time that my cholesterol needed to be lowered. So, this was a product of a relatively rare disease, and this happens to be a disease that is type 2 hyperlipidemia, homozygous mutation in this gene. I've actually seen cases of that, and it's a relatively rare disease. The other ones are just examples that give you sort of general sense about uh, this uh, osteoporosis uh, pseudoglioma syndrome, which is actually presented to an LDL receptor, which is actually the receptor that helps to break down uh, the LDL receptor, and it turns out that there's a potential treatment for osteoporosis based upon that work. And then finally, Marfan syndrome, which you probably are relatively familiar, is it turns out that although for years and years and years we believed the best therapy for Marfan syndrome was beta blockade, turns out that when they learned more about uh, that disease, uh, they found out that Losartan, 
was actually effective and actually helps to reduce aneurysms and other conditions as well. So those are sort of the spin-down effects that you can get from treating rare diseases. So I tell people it's sort of morally imperative uh, or it's a moral imperative for children to be part of research studies. And at the Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, I will tell you, we have drank that Kool-Aid and we really believe it. We believe that every child who comes here with a uh, disease, we should be learning about, to, about that disease better to change the outcome to improve their health. And so it's uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on uh, Drugs in 1995 really basically said we really need to study children and particularly children with rare diseases to better understand how to treat them to provide better, better health. So just to give you a little background, and I think you guys probably know this a bit, but I want to tell you this because I think it's important. And actually, Shelly and I didn't talk about this, but it's an overview of study medication in pediatrics in general. And you probably appreciate that most of the drugs Drugs that we use for treating pediatric conditions are not approved by the FDA. They have no pediatric indications. And as of 1990, and I don't think the numbers are much different in 2015, about three-quarters of the prescription drugs that we administer to infants and children have never been approved by the FDA. And so we use these in an off-label indication. As a practicing physician in the state of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, I'm allowed to prescribe any medication for whatever indication I want, um, but the use of off-label drugs is a bit of an experiment with each of these we use. We've learned a good bit about many of these drugs that are commonly used for cardiac care, GI care, and the other conditions as well as antibiotics, but it's not perfect. And uh, without having formalized studies of some of these drugs, we don't accrue any new data. And uh, we uh, don't really know how specifically to administer the drugs, although we've learned a good bit, a bit about this from trial and error over the last 30, 40 years. And I'm sure as parents and as patients with uh, rare diseases, you probably don't want to hear this, but that's in fact what the state of the art is for post most pediatric care. And as you know, the drugs that are used for treatment of congestive heart failure, most of them have not been tested in children specifically with specific dosing, and the dosing has been largely extrapolated from adult studies. So studies in children are important because the metabolism in infants and children at different ages differ from adults, the adverse event, pro uh, event profile differs considerably, and uh, there should be cons attention paid to ethical issues regarding whether it's appropriate to be administering specific drugs to kids without them being studied. So just to give you a little bit of background about this, uh, the pediatric drug development field, which I think you're all a little bit familiar with, was labeling requirement, believe it or not, didn't occur, that is pediatric labeling until 1979. I graduated from medical school in 1973, which means at that time, the drugs that we were administering didn't have a requirement to list anything about pediatric usage, either non, no studies or studies that had been performed. In 1997, uh, the uh, FDAMA, which is the, uh, basically the Modernization Act for the FDA, allowed extension of patents for uh, products that were studied in kids uh, to be extended by six months. And then uh, the BPCA, the Best Pharmaceuticals uh, for Children Act, which was passed in 2002 and subsequently uh, renewed in 2007, it renews this exclusivity of incentives studies, but also uh, identifies target areas where drugs are needed on a three-year basis. So this is an opportunity where if there were drugs related to Barth syndrome that specifically needed to be studied, uh, it would be appropriate to go to NICHD and to the FDA to lobby them to have those drugs tested uh, in children so that there was better understanding about them. So the impact of the FDAMA Act is that uh, early on, uh, uh, 40 agents were uh, then labeled, and then uh, there have been recently additional products that have been labeled uh, over the last several years with their pediatric indication. So this act has had some impact on uh, the issue of failure to be able to uh, 
uh, identify specific indications for uh, patients. So let me get back to the discussion again about uh, rare diseases and how important they are. And I will tell you that having gone through the process of testing a drug and then getting it approved by the FDA, I unfortunately understand way too much about the whole process. It's really, really important to understand the natural history of the disease. And I realized that Barr syndrome, after looking at some of the literature about it, uh, and, I, and I have to say I'm not an expert by a long shot, and an expert is defined as somebody who uh, knows no more than anybody else in the audience but has slides or comes from 50 miles away. So I guess uh, it's hard to know whether I qualify for either of those circumstances. Uh, but uh, at the very least, we know that, as an example, these conditions that are rare, we under, understand that they have tremendous phenotypic variability. That means the, the way they express. So as an example, certain patients with Barr syndrome may have fairly significant neutropenia, whereas others may not. They may have a variation in terms of the rate at which their cardiac function deteriorates and develop over congestive heart failure and come to either transplantation or die. Uh, that's very, very important. Um, it, it's, it, it's essential to understand that when you're trying to study disease. I think the other piece I left off this slide was it's very, very important to actually band people together from multiple institutions, particularly for the treatment of rare diseases, because at a given institution, no single institution is likely to be able to accrue enough information to be able to study any intervention that's likely to be effective, uh, unless I totally misunderstand the frequency of Barr syndrome. It's pretty clear also that single gene mutations, that is specific mutations, that is changes in this coding sequence uh, in the gene may produce different phenotypes even though the genetic mutation may be identical. And I told Shelley about an example that I had, and I'm sure there's plenty of others, because if you look at familial uh, phenotypes, they tend to vary quite tremendously in, in diseases like Barr syndrome. Um, it is essential to develop meaningful endpoints for drug therapies. That is, the investigators that work in this area need to find some endpoints that are biomarkers that they can use to demonstrate efficacy of any drugs they may use. And it can't be death because that takes way too long. There needs to be some biomarker in the blood that they can identify relatively handily or looking at shortening fractions by echo to determine that a drug is effective. So the, fo the FDA will always focus on endpoints uh, before drug approval and the endpoints must be realistic and likely include patient re reported outcomes. So Shelley and I talked about it, and I think this is pretty essential for a group like yours. Patient advocacy groups can promote research by supporting registries. Registries are extremely important. It allows you to be, actually identify patients who might be potential candidates for study. Uh, that means an investigator can reach out to them, assuming they give permission to be contacted. Repositories that have tissue and DNA are pretty essential for breakthroughs to occur. And, you know, we're working, I'm working within a network called Children, which is one looking at cholestatic liver disease in infancy, funded by NIDDK. And we're on the brink of probably working out some really, really important aspects of diseases that we deal with. And for these repositories, if you have them, and even for your, for your registries, you need to be sure that you're allowing access to only the highest quality research efforts. So people don't feel like they're wasting their time and feel like they're really making a meaningful contribution. So pediatric recruitment, this is a mouse and this is kind of a joke, but uh, it's really interesting so to get me to a concept about recruitment of patients. And this is where potentially uh, registries are really helpful. Identifying eligible subjects, then having someone explain studies, and you can use your newsletter to explain studies, obtaining informed consent, maintaining ethical standards, uh, making sure you get a representative adequate sample, and retaining study, study subjects so that they understand that their participation is really important. So the take-home message I have for you, believe it or not, I'm almost at 30 minutes, um, 
I think it's important to develop robust patient registries with detailed phenotyping, that is, as much information you can get from patients as possible to describe when they had their onset of symptoms, what kind of uh, manifestations they have of disease, so that you can then be able to provide that to investigators to help us do the study. Also, getting people organized and interacting on a positive fashion so that uh, they understand how important it is to participate in research to make advances that actually will not only help them potentially, but also patients with similar conditions in the future. It's really, really important to understand the natural history of disease and characterize it since it's essential to drug development and approval. Uh, the, the targets for treatment with endpoints are, need to be those that actually can be achieved. And remember that studies of drugs in children are essential to safe and effective management diseases in children, especially rare diseases, and we cannot extrapolate our experience in adults to children. So overall, I'd say uh, I can't emphasize more how important it is to actually foster your folks that are part of your PAG or your patient advocacy group to participate in research. Um, the, it, your newsletter should allow you to be able to uh, tell people what uh, opportunities are available uh, and uh, encourage participation. And uh, I would use your newsletter as a vehicle to demonstrate uh, what advances are coming down the pike uh, as well as what studies have been done or proposed to be done and what outcomes are expected uh, to help people to understand the importance of participating in research. And with that, it is now uh, 11 o'clock. Well, that was a lot of uh, information that you covered. Yeah, and definitely. I appreciate it. <laughs> you did great. And it was, um, and I think everybody now in the room thinks you need to come to the birth side. There's a lot of nodding and a <laughs> lot of questions. Um, I want it. We have a dad who has a, um, he's going to unmute himself in just a moment. Um, he has a question for you. Um, I do have a question about the endpoint that you mentioned, um, yes. with bar syndrome is, as you may, I'm sure you've seen this, as you mentioned earlier, you know, it's not, not all of the, um, individuals who have the disease are going to have exhibit the cardinal characteristics of the disease. But what we have found with Bar syndrome, even though some of the boys may have cardiomyopathy, some of them may have problems with neutropenia, um, it does appear that the one thing that seems to be uniform with all of them is the skeletal muscle involvement. And there is a question about the six, a six minute walk being a, um, an endpoint or something that we could measure and have some baseline studies for that um, and then as an endpoint. Has that, have, do you have any experience with something along those lines or does it have to be a medical test? I think no, so. Well, uh, a six minute walk, you know, you could, for this, you can characterize what's normal and look at changes and define what the difference in terms of changes that you would identify as being significant. And this is the kind of thing where when you do t a test like a six minute walk, you would go to the FDA and actually, if somebody wanted to actually test a drug, they would say, okay, we're going to use this as our endpoint. And, and, and as I said, they're going to require that you have patient related outcomes. So quality of life is going to be part of this as well. So that um, the FDA can give guidance about what they think will be a meaningful change in a six minute walk with an intervention. The other piece, quite frankly, Shelley, the other, you have to always have to keep in mind is during the course of this, the natural history is very important because the FDA is going to say, well, what would have happened if you hadn't intervened? And I don't know that unless you've got, um, my, my sense about this is that with our drug that we used, we really felt that it was ethically inappropriate to withhold drug because we knew if the patients didn't get the drug, they were going to develop cirrhosis and die. And if you have a study that's actually a finite length of time and patients are not going to deteriorate markedly in that period of time, then the FDA might say to you, well, you need to conduct a placebo-controlled trial to look at your endpoint to see what happens during the natural course versus 
what happens with an intervention with a drug. Thank you. Okay, Brian uh, Drake, thank you for that, that thoughtful answer. Brian Drake um, has a question for you. He's one of our dads. Brian, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, can you, can you hear me? Absolutely. Um, so we have a drug called Bezafibrate, I believe Bar Syndrome has been doing research on um, for some time now. It's a drug that was um, used in other countries, um, I believe, to lower cholesterol. Right. Um, how how um, quickly would drugs from other company, uh, countries be approved by the FDA um, for use in um, our boys? Well, that's a really interesting question. Depend is so the question really is to begin with one: if there's an existing drug that has a safety profile that's already recognized, that you have a little bit of a leg up. Um, if it's not been studied and actually approved for this indication in Europe or some other uh, agency, then you really are obliged to sort of start from the beginning. So um, you. I, I think the answer is I probably need a little bit more information. I, I knew I saw that, that this fibrate was being used, and fibrates have been used pretty uh, aggressively because they're PPR uh, gamma uh, antagonists for treatment of a number of conditions. Um, and I think, generally speaking, the safety profile is such that certainly the FDA would not say, oh, this is way too toxic to try in your patients. Um, so the issue sort of boils down to how quickly. Quickly de depends upon, one, an investigator getting an IND, writing a protocol, and then recruiting a sufficient number of subjects to um, demonstrate that there's some efficacy. And the efficacy would depend upon what endpoint you were going to look at in terms of defining success. And that's why I said you can't use something like death as an endpoint because it's a ridiculous endpoint. You have to have some measurable uh, biomarker that will tell you that you're changing or moving the dial with that therapy. So is the drug approved in Europe for this indication? No, I don't believe so. So how much experience do they have in Europe with it? Um, I was told it's been use, in use over 20 years for um, um, lowering cholesterol or and or blood pressure, I believe. Well, it's been used for those indications. The real question is how much use has there been in your disease? Okay. I don't think there's much question that the drug probably won't get a huge amount of scrutiny for safety unless all the experience has only been adults. However, with rare diseases, they're going to give you, the FDA will give you some leniency. And I, I can tell you, I've had experience with the EMA. The EMA accepts some kind, a, a submission called a bibliographic submission, which can basically be publications demonstrating efficacy, and they'll accept that without actually looking at raw data. When we went to the EMA, we had raw data from our experience for a number of years, uh, and they looked at that. But a competing company actually went to the FDA from Europe when they had patients studied in Europe, and they accepted that indication. The FDA doesn't care necessarily where your patients are studied. Uh, that doesn't bother them so much, but they're going to require that you have some kind of organized study to demonstrate efficacy. I had another question, too. Um, and I, I um, think of drugs being one treatment for Bar syndrome and um, uh, the genetic side being solved by another method. Um, I've been reading a lot about CRISPR. Um, I know it's not ready yet, but I, it, it seems like there's a race between drugs and um, genetic modification um, at the gene level. Um, is the gene level um, modification, is that, that would have to go through FDA scrutiny as well? Oh, yes. It would have to go through a different uh, biologic branch because it would be a vector insertion of uh, a corrected gene uh, to, uh, to do this. And although um, 
take this with a grain of salt. I can tell you the stringency that they look at biologics is a good bit higher than it is for drugs. Okay, thank you. Um, this is this is Shelley. There is some, I believe, there's been some, um, there have been some studies with basafibrate with animal models, but it hasn't been um, real. It hasn't been used or studied in those in individuals who have Barr syndrome. Um, so we're working towards that. So I think it was particularly interesting when you said that in Cincinnati that you were able to prescribe uh, medications that have been FDA approved for off-label use. Um, I found that very interesting. I don't know if do both Dr. Jeffries and Zaza are still on and if they would like to unmute themselves, if they have any history there, that might help um, with Brian's question. Well, before we, before we get to them, here's, here's the issue with the FDA. If you went in with an IND, for a fibrate, uh, you'd have to submit, uh, the company would likely submit for the investigator an IND uh, that is a master drug file with the IND that describes their previous experience. And they would want to see, you know, what animal studies that actually preceded the uh, decision to use a, a fibrate in humans. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Jeffries, do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> yeah, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so Dr. Hobby's right. Uh, usually in those sorts of applications, a drug company, they'll provide letters of cross-reference which supply the existing data that they have for, for both animal, so preclinical and also clinical data. Um, the, this particular drug does, does not have a U.S. approval for uh, as a, as a cholesterol-lowering therapy currently. So some drugs we use in the States have already been approved and we're going to use them for a different indication. It doesn't mean it's not possible, but there will be some sort of plan. You know, uh, Zaza's data in the animals would be very helpful in moving that forward, but usually for these sorts of efforts you'll need a partnership with a drug company, for example, which I think is something that's been in discussion for this particular therapy. And then there is a plan for a European investigation as well, so something targeted for the states, for the FDA, and then also for something for the for the EU. I think yeah, that's that. Thank you, Dr. Jeffries, for giving that insight. I appreciate it. Um, we would like for you to recruit Dr. Hybe to the bar side, please. <laughs> <laughs> you and Dr. Strauss and uh, Zaza are hereby recruited to recruit Dr. Hybe. Okay. We just think he's wonderful. 